cozy for well for a couple minutes. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, I was asked to share uh, some insights. I didn't develop a PowerPoint presentation, um, so I hope you can forgive me for that. <laughs> no. <laughs> But anyway, bonjour, danse, zombie venezi, and an ancient class who told them. My Christian name is Clayton Thomas Mueller. I'm a campaigner from Canada. I, I work on um, extreme energy issues, um, sovereignty issues, um, and, and basically do everything that I can to contribute to the establishment of the largest social movement ever in the history of the five fingered nation, aka <laughs> humans. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, what I was invited to come here and talk about today was how to be an ally. Um, and I assume that came from kind of the frame of how do people living and organizing, campaigning, and just, you know, being uh, here in the UK. And is, it, is everybody here from the UK? Everybody? Well, I mean, y'all live here and work in the UK? Okay, with the exception of my sister. All right. And Larry, I know you're all over the planet. Um, <laughs> Derek. 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 Well, yeah. So, anyway. Okay, cool. Um, and so, I, uh, this, that's a huge question. You know, with, with an even huger answer. Um, but one thing I will say is this. Um, <coughs> When we look at the history of organizing, the history of social movements, uh, the history of uh, imperialism, the expansion, uh, European expansion, European interests expanding all over the world, there's other examples too with other empires on the planet, Europe ain't the only one, um, I just want to recognize that. Uh, when we look at the history of how Europe colonized the heck out of itself before it went and colonized the heck out of the world. Um, I mean, there's, it's deep, you know, there's a million places you can go uh, and a million university and college courses that you can take to do that. But what I want to talk about is just kind of some applied knowledge on how we view social change theory uh, from, you know, indigenous environmental network who I've worked with for the last decade and other organizations that I've helped uh, over the years. Um, most notably, Defenders of the Land Network in Canada. Now. For us, you know, I think part of what we've been really trying to articulate to people is that when we organize uh, to take on, you know, systemic change, to facilitate systemic change, there's a couple of things that we've got to talk about. Right at the beginning, when we get together and form coalitions to achieve great political objectives. One of them, of course, is racism. Another one, of course, is uh, uh, oppression in general, okay? Whether that's gender oppression, uh, age, ageism, you know, sexism, heterosexism, you name it. Um, the other thing that we talk about is colonialism, okay? And, you know, I think just to put it out there, when we organize, um, we have to ensure that we always have that very basic conversation at the beginning of any journey to get from A to Z, right? Um, we got to talk about anti-colonialism, anti-racism, anti-oppression. And the reason why we got to do that is because of the fact that, at least where I come from in North America, Vast coalitions have crumbled, okay, like houses of cards, because they didn't have this conversation about these things, and they didn't make some very basic agreements. Now, when I say that we have to have a conversation as, uh, you know, technicians in the movement, okay, as organizing in support of the earth and people who depend on the earth, and of course all those others that, you know, can't speak for themselves, our plant and animal relations. <clears throat> we have to understand that, that, that what I'm telling you right now, or what I'm sharing with you, is that we don't have to solve these problems right now, okay? That's not what I'm 
that. And you're like, oh my God, here we go. My white liberal guilt's going to come out. Oh. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to do here. All I'm saying is that, you know, when we look at this stuff, we have to understand that what we need to develop are the mechanisms to effectively confront and overcome and solve those problems when they pop up in our work. And they do. When they pop up in our work and when systems of oppression start to play out in our work, um, we have to have the mechanisms, the knowledge, okay, and the, and the political will to be able to effectively deal with them so that they don't um, uh, poison the integrity of our work, all right? Now, there are some frameworks out there in North America that, and you all should have your pens and stuff, because we're all keeners and taking notes, um, and the note takers are going to send us stuff around. But there are some key frameworks that have been developed by what we call frontline communities. Now, in North America, in the United States, and in Canada, typically communities that are disproportionately affected by extreme energy operations, by climate change, um, by the economic framework that we live under, um, <clears throat> tend to be low income and tend to be racialized. Um, tend to be indigenous, okay? Uh, and that's both in the rural and in the urban context. And so, for us, you know, there's been a long history of, of these communities standing up and, and saying no more, all right? Now, in the United States, we have what's called the environmental justice movement. Now, the environmental justice movement was born out of the inadequacies of the environmental movement and the inadequacies of the civil rights movement, okay? Now, that's not to criticize those movements necessarily, but just to say that those movements had some gaps, some vacuums, okay? And one of them was, of course, when we look at the environmental movement, what did that come out of? Well, it came out of the, um, what's the founder of Sierra Club? Mew? No. Uh, no, no, was it, the, the guy out, he, he was like a mountain climber or something. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> when we look at this kind of Eurocentric, kind of ethnocentric perspective of nature, of wilderness, as vast empty landscapes uh, uh, devoid of any human contact that need to be conserved, you know, for our future generations so they can go connect with Mother Earth by driving over her in their SUV or whatever, <laughs> or ATVs. <laughs> we have to understand that, you know, those places are my backyard. You know, our ancestors are buried there, all right? Our, our, our whole history is there. Um, there are stories, there are names of all of these places, you know, from the original people that lived there. And it's important to recognize that stuff um, because, you know, for environmental, uh, the environmental movement, at least the classical one in America, they fail to recognize that environmental issues fundamentally for communities who are land dependent, specifically indigenous communities, Environmental issues are fundamentally issues and matters of human rights to us, okay? And there's a whole language and frame, methodology, approach to environmental organizing that has a human rights dynamic. And then when we look at the civil rights movement, you know, the civil rights movement was awesome. It was really, really hip and cool and powerful, tragic, you know, it was a beautiful narrative that continues to be told in so many different ways. And, one of the challenges, though, that I think the, human, the civil rights movement had was that it tend, there were a lot of people in the civil rights movement who looked at environmentalism and the conservation movement as a white thing, okay? We got bigger shit to deal with right now, is what came out of that movement. You know, we're dying. You know, we're getting thrown in jail. You know, our civil rights are being oppressed. <coughs> and they failed to see the fact that environmental issue, the environmental movement was very much, you know, at least especially for Native Americans, um, you know, the human rights movement was very much an environmental thing to us, okay? When we talk about the poisoning of our lakes, our rivers, our streams, it's a human rights thing for us, okay? Especially for uh, rural communities uh, who are still heavily subsidizing their diets on the subsistence, you know, with subsistence practices. And so, I'm just laying all this down real quick here to basically get to some examples that I wanted to share with you. <clears throat> so that's the first point. Whenever we organize in coalitions, we have to make 
agreements about these things. And we have to stick to those agreements, okay? Or be very upfront that we're not willing to make agreements about that so that we know where you're coming from. And that's what you have to do, especially being based in, in Europe, in the biggest financial place on earth, financial control place on earth, <clears throat> London Square Mile, you know, where all the financing for all the horrible things that go on are determined. You know, you all have a certain privilege just by geography, and you all have a certain privilege um, just by being where you are, you know, and, and who you are, that other people around the world don't have. And that power can be leveraged very greatly to shift power paradigms. And so, what I want to talk about, though, basically here for the last six minutes that I have, um, that's 10 minutes. You've had 10 minutes already. Is that 10 minutes? I'm done? Okay, well, let me just quickly say this. Two minutes. The Indigenous Tar Sands campaign is a really great model to take a look at in terms of um, effective ally work. We put tremendous amounts of resources as indigenous peoples to reaching out to the anarchist movements, to the um, you know, various uh, you know, urban-based movements in Canada and in the United States to basically establish a strong network in just about every city of indigenous solidarity groups, non-native groups, uh, who tied their political organizing to environmental justice issues near their urban centers are going on right in within them. And they grounded their organizing strategies and tactics in, in a strong anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-oppression framework. Now, I, I can give a million examples of spectacular actions that happened regionally, but what that led to was um, kind of the hitting of a glass ceiling with our extremist right-wing government that we have which forced us to look beyond the borders of Canada and the United States to look at other places in the world where we could develop this kind of organizing framework and agreements with, with our kind of settler background or European background and friends, um, which led to us coming here to the United Kingdom, meeting, hooking up with Climate Camp, where we were able to have a conversation with the climate justice movement over here about these things, okay? And we were able to make some agreements about a long-term organizing strategy that wasn't about influencing the next political uh, election cycle, but that was about fundamentally of systemic change, okay? And flipping the power paradigm and allowing communities carrying the greatest impact to lead the movement, to be raised to the forefront of the movement, and their narratives to be the ones that were being told to the movement, okay? Because for us, it wasn't about in the United States and Canada and over here too very much. It's not about trying to focus on electoral strategies necessarily. We're not trying to get people out to vote. We're trying to get people out to hit the streets, to do a base building strategy, to expand our political base of resistance, to build up an army of resistors, to create enough friction of salmon swimming up that river, you know, against the current, to create systemic change. And you know what that relationship with Climate Camp created was a very deep relationship with Rising Tide UK and a very deep relationship with the group that, that in, became the UK Tar Sands Network, which provided a very strong model of organizing in solidarity with frontline communities that you know we're now kind of talking about as a clear example of how best to be an ally. Now, in conclusion, there are some organizing frameworks. One critical document that you should all read, okay, interpret in your own way, um, and then talk to somebody like me to give you my interpretation of it, are the 17 principles of environmental justice, okay? You can Google it, it's on a million websites. The other one is the statement of settler support for defenders of the land in Canada, which was a document that this amazing network of indigenous solidarity uh, organizations in Canada created at the first defenders of the land meeting. Yeah? Sorry, it's not easy to repeat that. Just Google defenders of the land um, solidarity statement. And I'll make sure and give it to the organizers of this meeting. Um, 
But basically, you know, that's what I can give you in 10 minutes. Um, but this is the core of it, right here. You know, and of course, you know, takes, there's lots of really great trainings out there, like anti-racism trainings, anti-oppression trainings. Check out the School of Unity and Liberation out of the Bay Area. They have spectacular trainings that are done in popular education style approaches, uh, all developed by both, you know, white folks and people of color, you know, amazing trainings. Uh, so check them out too. And I'll just leave it at that and I look forward to some questions. So Yvonne? Thanks so much. Thank you.